Go. Welcome to the Radical World, the podcast, the Pioneer series, Radical Pioneers, season two, episode one. I'm Jose Lanel, and I'm with my partner, Matt Perez. Today, we don't have Tulio Saragusa with us. Tulio is um, moving. Tulio's doing. We, we have no idea what he's doing, but we know he's not here. So um, we've in season one, we talked about um, what is radical and how radical came about and what it was that uh, we did in that process of discovering um, what has led to radical world. And um, we were gonna talk about how we make a radical world, Matt. And so last episode, you were saying, we don't know how to make a radical world and we, we really don't. Uh, uh. So it, it kind of left me thinking, well, then what are we doing here if we have no idea what we're doing? Um, so wh what did you mean by that? What, what were you saying when you said we don't know? Well, so what we've done is we have a foundation, which is very simple. It's five things. Um, and we have comments to, to kind of run that out. But in reality, on top of that foundation, you have to do other things. And every community is going to be different. So in that sense, we don't know what it's going to end up with. Uh, we didn't want to have a 17-page constitution kind of thing or, or anything very fiat. You know, if you don't do it this way, you're not radical. Um, it, it's more of, of creating the alternatives to fiat. But we know, we know the ingredients, right? But we know the ingredients. We know and the ingredients. And the main ingredient is people. You have to, uh, you know, any, anybody who tries to address the 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 procedure or the functions, or he's missing the point, or she's missing the point. Um, the first thing is people. So what works for people? Okay, this. Oh, and people will say, oh, but we also need this, and we also need that. And rather than saying no, you can't do that, you can't um, limit it to that, then then we say every community will define what that is. And it has to be explicit, and it has to be uh, out there for other Okay, so, so go back. Community. What's explicit? What do you mean by it needs to be explicit? Okay, so every so if you add other rules, and rules are a dangerous thing, but if you add other, other rules, um, it, they can't be secret rules. It's got to be known to everybody, so that people can. Why? So that people can challenge them and say, "Well, I don't think that's the right rule. I think it should be this other rule." And what I like calling protocols. What you like calling protocols, and I don't. And uh, and um, so that's what I mean by that. Is it's not that. It, you can't get started. We we have the minimal ingredients. What we think are the minimal ingredients in the in the pot, and but if you want to add other ingredients, fine. So Let's experiment and see what happens. Experiment. So that that's the the key is experiment, experiment, experiment. Yes. Experiment. Yes. Yes. Now we're we've we've done a little bit of experimenting. We've got a whole yeah. bunch of people around the world that we know that have been doing experiments. Yes. Um, can we talk a little bit about the experiments that we know about? Obviously you experimented, you've been experimenting for years uh, yeah. to some degree. Um, we've experimented with, with some of our partners uh, over the last year or two. How, um, let, let's talk about the, the, you know, the experiments that may or may not be fully radical but are experiments that use some of the radical ingredients? Well, experiments that go on top of the foundation. I mean, so, so for example, if you make a rule, um, it's got to be open to everybody. 
they can be secret rules that I carry in my carry in my head, and you guys don't know what it is, and I get to explain it every time, and I get to human beings that we are, we get to change it every time. Um, so that's the most important thing. Um, you like every experiment, you have to say what you expect to get from the experiment. Um, and if it doesn't work, if it doesn't work, and you come up with other rules. And, um, and part of that is every rule that goes on top of the foundation can be challenged. You know, any, any member of the team uh, can challenge the rules. If there's 100 people in a team and 99 like the rule and you don't, you don't belong in that team. You don't belong in that committee. Um, so, and when, when you say that you don't belong in that community, who who's making that definition? You, you're making that definition. So if I'm the one saying, I want to change the rule, and 99 people say, but we like it, you know, there's something wrong with the rule, then it's up to you to either go along with the rule as it is or, or get out. And... Um, and that's it. That's that's what it amounts to. So, let, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, the experiments. Um, maybe start with uh, Mondragon. You you've experienced, you've met the folks at Mondragon, right? And um, you you've experienced sort of what what it's like there. They're a co-op. Do you want to tell? The, the folks about what that yeah, means? They, they're a co-op. They're the biggest co-op in the world. Um, it's a Spanish comp uh, company. And uh, <clears throat> and they're all over the place. It's not just one business. It's a conglomeration of businesses. And uh, it's strictly co-management. And co-management with a hierarchy, uh, which breaks the mold of, of radical right away um it, and this creates some problems so for example the the first company they created was a, an appliance company and uh fargo i think it was called and um and at one point they they couldn't compete with chinese i don't remember what the cost was but most european companies were shutting down their appliance uh, approach. And um, and they said, oh, we can be the only European uh, company left alive doing appliances. And uh, the only thing that we need is that we take the money from the, the, the common money, the common money that we accumulated for different things, and we use it to pay people and, and keep going. And then as the business starts to pick up, we will put it back. Well, the business is never picked up. And and the thing is, people voted for, yeah, yeah, let's do that. On the assumption that, I'm guessing, on the assumption that um, the bosses in the hierarchy, the people on top, uh, were looking out for them. And they were. They, I'm not saying they were dishonest or anything. But they have their own strategy. They thought they could pull it off with two years worth of uh, money, and uh, it wasn't enough. So in the end, they had to close Fargo, the the first uh, company that they ever started. And uh, and I think very few people lost their job because everybody else was accommodated in other in other parts of the company, but. Um, People were workers were out in the street saying, "Save our jobs, save our jobs, save our jobs," and um, because of um, this idea, they didn't understand what was going on. Nobody bothered to say, "Look, we got two years," and ta da, and, and none of that, and um, and so they felt. Like somebody stabbed them in the back, and they and only so, stabbed themselves in the back. So the lesson there is: 
what was missing in that in, in their formula, what is missing in their formula, because they're still acting in this way, is they're not co-managed, they're simply co-owned. And in the way that they're co-owned is through oh, co owned. yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah. And so their co-ownership is um from the old style of you vote for your management the management runs the show until their their uh, cycle is over and then you get the vote for another management five years later right. whatever the case may be and so <laughs> you're really as a co-owner you don't really manage things no. you simply vote and yeah. and that's that's what's missing in that thing and, and they that, have departments and, and they have bosses and they have managers and they have supervisors and it's it's a no it's a fiat company right with, with co-ownership a la co-op so right. um co-ops everybody gets the same and what they've done in the underground because of different levels um every level gets the same regardless of contributions and uh and things has got to be in our opinion, it's got to be based on some level of contribution. If, if you just join the company and sit back and do nothing, then you're not contributing anything. You're not, I mean, you're part of the, of the community, but you're not contributing to a community. And um, so another and, example, another example that's, that's a close one that we both know about is, uh -huh. is that of uh, Morningstar uh Morning tomatoes want, yeah right and they're they're here close to us uh in in california and they're if not the world's largest tomato processor one of the largest tomato processors i think they're one of the largest yeah yeah and um during peak season they've got 2500 employees working and right. harvesting and processing uh tomatoes to to, for, to do tomato paste and they're the opposite of Mondragon, right? They they have a purely self-managed yes. organization, but still Chris Rufus is the owner of the, the business. Boss. Yes. And he's the boss. Ultimately, yeah. he's the boss. Whether it's self-managed or not, he is the owner and therefore... Uh, is the ultimate uh, right. boss and that the example there is is kind of the opposite of mondragon yeah uh they're they're well great self-management but at the end of the day you still have an owner and the team though they might feel like they own stuff they don't actually benefit from ownership and right. don't ultimately have ownership um in, yeah. in the organization let's clarify that is um and i've experienced that in my previous jobs is we want people to feel right like they own their job and they, they own their job in, in self in self-managed companies uh which my previous company was um you could change and, and trade and stuff like that but going from um let's say fans to some other group because there were departments was fairly difficult. Pe most people wouldn't think of it. Uh, people who thought of it made the change and, uh, but most people wouldn't think of it. And in fact, you tell them, maybe you'd be better at blah, 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 blah. And they go, no, no, that's not my department. I'm a programmer. I'm a financial person or whatever. Uh, so so yeah they're two quadrants of a four by four well i would say two quadrants the, the you mean two by two yeah two by two, <laughs> four two are you four. driving a four by four is that is that what's happening yeah yeah and uh and and what we what radical is is bringing those two together or some versions of those together into a model of co-ownership and co-management right 
And co-ownership so, is very important because otherwise you don't you don't own anything. You're working for the man. So so, so what we've just talked about is is the cooperative model, which is Mondragon, and and there are other co-ops around the world, right. where for the most part, co-ops are like Mondragon. They're co-owned but not co-managed. Right. Then you have these co-man co managed organizations or self-managed organizations as they often call themselves yeah. um, that are managed like um, Morningstar, um, co-managed like Morningstar, but but are not co-owned. Right. Uh, and maybe you want to tell the story about Nearsoft and, and why um, sometimes self-management or co-management isn't enough um, for that organization to stay in right. that one. Right. Yeah, it, it's not enough because you still have a boss. You still have um, you still have an owner. And uh, what we experienced there in, in Nearsoft is that even though we weren't the bosses, we weren't telling people what to do, uh, people come to us and say, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? And I always ask the question of, are you asking for permission or are you asking for advice? And um, and people learn very quickly to say, I'm asking for advice. But that wasn't really true. They were asking for permission because the owner is still perceived as the owner that he is. And uh, therefore, the, the at the top of the hierarchy, so to speak. Um, so even though it was co-managed and uh, and stuff like that, it, it wasn't the fact that we were the owners was a problem. And in fact, when we sold the company in 2017, um, a third came to me. A third of the company that the, the revenue from the sale um, went to my partner, and the third went to everybody else. And people would tell me, oh, that's very generous. But I always knew there was something wrong with it. Yeah, it's very generous, but it's still up to me. I could cut it to 20% at the last minute. And uh, <clears throat> and so that's that's not a co-owned company. It's, it was owned by my partner and I, and we decided to give them as a, you know, out of our own heart. As a, as a gift. <laughs> as a gift. We gave them 30% of the company. Big whip, you know. It well, was, well, you gave them, you gave them a, a twenty or the thirty percent of interest in the company, but not management or ownership of the company. Really, not, not ownership. No, it was right. more of a, you know, if a hundred dollars came in, they got thirty-three. We got thirty-three, and we got thirty-three. That's fine, right? But. Um, but it was a gift. It was something that came out of, you know, because we thought of ourselves as right. good people and all that right. shit. Right. Um, it's not a decision they could make. Okay. Right. They then make it a a financial decision when they decided, um, for example, what what the breakdown was. So we we give the we, we accumulate money at the end of the year. And uh, some money went to the to next year to fund next year, and some money was distributed among all of us. And um, first of all, we made the decision of how much was going to go to Fisher, how much was going to say uh, to pay for the past, so to speak. Um, so, uh, so, um, so yeah, Carlos, please remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that meant for us. Uh, so, um, and, and they decided that instead of, um, and there was a very complex formula that, that my partner had come up with. It was really complete and took degrees and your service and all this stuff. You know, it was very complete and nobody understood. <laughs> And including me, and um, and so this person, one one person in the company, said, "I want to know how the 
how the formula goes and if we could change it and stuff like that. And about 90% of the company said, I want to be in that team. But of course, you couldn't do that. Um, so they, they came down to a team of nine, I think it was. And uh, they traveled one model, they bounced it off the people, it didn't work. Started another model, they bounced it off the people, it didn't work. And finally, they said, you know what? We divide by N. If there's a hundred dollars in of revenue or accumulated revenue, and a uh, hundred people, everybody gets a dollar. The clean lady, everybody gets a dollar. So that was a financial decision that normally would fall on myself or my partner. Um, and but they took it, and we went along with it. You know, we didn't challenge it or anything. Yeah. So, so we started drifting in that direction, but it wasn't a clear model like we have with co-ownership now. And um, and it wasn't intentional. It was more of a, oh, we were nice people and we gave them money away. Uh, uh, but it wasn't the right thing. So and, go ahead. No, I, no I, I just wanted to, to sort of move on to, to thinking about another um, model, because we're talking about the structure of the organization, right? Yeah, how, how they're yeah. composed, not not so much the things that are happening. We can talk about those in another episode. But uh, another uh, well-known company, um, globally well-known, at least in our um, environments, yeah. is Birdsort, right? Birdsort, yeah. which I can never pronounce properly, but uh, hopefully people know what I'm talking about. It is a nursing company, a neighborhood nursing company in the Netherlands. And the difference between uh, their structure and the average company is, is that they are a nonprofit right. with a centralized operation at uh, central operations, but there are no managers either right. at the regional level or at the local level. And the, the way that they're structured is they have dozens and dozens and dozens. Now I think they're over 10,000 nurses. Well, wow. And those 10,000 nurses are broken up into a team of 10 to a dozen people and they operate on their own. They are the team. They make the decisions locally. They decide what they're going to do. They, they manage the schedules. They manage their work hours. They do all of that locally. And they count on head office, if you will, to provide them with the technology, provide them with the support, and all of those kinds of things to make that happen, mm -hmm. including having a handful of coaches. I, I don't know how many they have now, but at one point, when they were in the four or 5,000 nurses, they only had a handful of coaches that were going around and coaching here and there um, uh, around the country. So it's a very different model. It's, it's different than uh, any of the three we've already talked about. First, mm -hmm. that it's uh, a nonprofit. It's the first nonprofit we've talked about. Uh, and second, that the teams operate independently and get services from the central and and are not very intimate, if you will. They, they don't have right. to deal with them uh, day in and day out. Um, so in that case, the, the distinction is really one, there's leadership, but he's not an owner. Right. Uh, Yosef Block. Um, he his uh he doesn't tell anybody what to do at the team level um, i know a story of 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 uh one of the teams discovered that a lot of their patients were getting hurt at home hmm. and they were getting hurt getting shipped to the hospital you know leg leg was mended now the nurse had to come in and help them with the the thing and what the nurses found out was well, they're slipping and falling. They're tripping and falling. Why aren't we doing a, 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 the job of rectifying that situation right, right. before before they trip and fall? Right? Because 
you know, we're not here just to make money. Tri them tripping and falling makes us more money. But at the end of the day, we're here to make their lives better. Yes. So they decided to actually offer a new service from scratch by themselves, pilot it out. And now I think most of the teams offer this service as well, which is when they get a patient to come to them for the first time, they do this evaluation on behalf of the, the government because the government is the, the payer. Uh, they do this evaluation to reduce the risks in the home. Right. And the way this happened was that one team that made that experiment sent it in to Joseph, uh, Joseph Block, um, and, and he sent out in his newsletter, here's an experiment. If you guys like it, keep experimenting. He didn't mandate it. He didn't say it was a good idea or a bad idea. He just said, experiment seems to be working and let everybody adopt it. Right. And I, that's a very different model than either of the th any of the three that we've talked about, where the individual who isn't an owner has removed himself from dictating what needs to happen and how it's going to happen in yeah. an operational level. Um, see, what are your thoughts example, about that? For example, in that case, there is a rule that you go, you you send information to this, this central team and they send information back in the newsletter. The good news about that is that's a rule. That's just a rule that they implement that. And it works for the them. process, yeah. Yeah, and um, and it works for them. It may work for a lot of other people. Uh, so that that's kind of closer to what we have in mind for for radical is is different people who find different things, let it be known to everybody, and uh, some people will be interested and some people won't. Uh, the the critical thing that you mentioned is that they piloted the project, they promoted, not promoted, it just announced the project that it worked and blah, 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 and people adopted it. Not all of them. Nobody's forced to adopt them, but um, but they can adopt. It's local, uh, well, local, I don't know what to call it. There's knowledge that's coming out of that experiment and uh, and it's being spread all over the place, and that that is the model of of uh, radical. This and one of the rules might be um, you announce this thing on Tuesdays, or you announce this thing on a newsletter, or whatever. Right. Um, if it works for everybody, fine. If somebody says, "Oh, Tuesday doesn't work for some reason, we should make it Thursday," then then you are in your right to challenge that Tuesday thing and make it a Thursday or make it Thursday and, and Tuesday. Um, the, there's not, nothing sacred. There's no boss saying, well, you can't do that because I say so or else. Um, nothing like that. Right. With radical. Right. The main but, thing. And, and I think we're getting close to the end. So, so let's talk for a minute or two about um, how do we resolve those conflicts? Because if everybody wants to do, you know, I want to do it on Monday, you want to do it on Tuesday, and the other guy wants to do it on Wednesday, and everybody else wants to do it every other day of the week, um, how, how do we solve that? Like, isn't that a, isn't that crazy? Isn't that a mess? Talking. Um, yeah, yeah the, the, the usual thing that we do is we jump to chaos. Oh, it's chaos. It's not chaos. It's a matter of talking to the people that are, promoting one one or the other and there's always um well I shouldn't say that, but there's always somebody who's louder than anybody else. Now Monday has to be it or Tuesday has to be it and uh and you have to say suck. And and the thing is once you're not competing, oh my Monday one, my Tuesday one kind of thing, when you're collaborating, which is what we're trying to to with radical, um, it, it gets very different. 
it's like, what do you like when they all because the day after Sunday and it doesn't rain or whatever the, the story is. And, and but, but, but it's an experiment. Each of those is an experiment. And it's each of those is an opportunity to say, oh, I thought Tuesday was better. But it turns out that I'm seeing that we're getting better response on Wednesdays. Yeah. And that's and, another and, thing. You can run an experiment that runs Monday for a month and Tuesday for a month and like that. Uh, so seven months later, you go, which one got the most response? Friday. Okay, Friday it is. You know, that kind of thing. Um, if, if we we learn, I think the key here with experimentation, which is a part of, of the foundations, experimentation is not just a process it's a mindset because it, yes yes if we think of it as just a oh let's do an experiment then it's too late because yes. if we think of the experiment as everything we do is open to experimentation mm -hmm. anything that we think about is open to experimentation and it's not about I know Thursday is right because I say so. It's, oh, what if we try Tuesday? I think Tuesday might be a good thing. Yeah. It's, the, it's the mindset of an experiment in my idea. The, my idea isn't absolute. It's just yes, an idea. Yeah. yeah. Everybody just has an idea. Their idea isn't, unless they know something secret, special, Maybe they have experience, maybe whatever, but it's still just, they're just promoting this idea. Right. And we only know if the idea is valid when we experiment it. Yes. And a, a, a lot of times, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, is because, oh, in my previous job, when we did it on Tuesday, this happened. When we did it on Wednesday, wow, we had a perfect response. That was your previous job. In this job, we don't know, and um, unless we know from from experience, right? But um, but yeah, it's you have to experiment with things, and you have to talk about the experiment because it, it, it's not always obvious what the thing should be. It's like, well, Tuesday is bad, uh, worse than a little bit worse than Wednesday, but. Tuesday is when something happens and, you know, it's better for audience and stuff like that. So um, there, that's what comes out in the conversation. Oh, the audience, we forgot about the yeah. audience. <laughs> Why don't we do an experiment on the audience? And, uh, and you have to treat those things. So that I think is more business friendly than the way it is now, which is, I thought of it. I think Tuesday is a good way. I read some more the Tuesday a good way. So let's try Tuesday. Let's do Tuesday. Not not try Tuesday. Let's do Tuesday, and uh, and you start doing it, and you don't know why you're doing it. Right. And well, uh, and, and we've learned from the technology space that our assumptions of what will work and what won't work. Mm -hmm. can only be t proven if we test it. And so yes. A-B testing, experimentation is really the way that we know what works and what doesn't. And we can refine through this process of, of testing and then experimenting and, and find the right solutions. It sounds mm -hmm. like it is actually a laborious, slow process, but it turns out that you can quickly run through different iterations of, of experiments very quickly and arrive at answers that you never would have known what the answer was based right. on speculation alone. And they're more, more business friendly. Okay, so if I get a better response from Wednesday than I get from Tuesday, and I go with Wednesday, that that give me certain audience that responds to those types of things. Um, that's more business friendly than, oh, I just thought of it and you're going to do it on Wednesday. Um, 
so yeah, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of fiat things that are business hustle. It's a weird thing to say, but every time I say it, I kind of um, hold myself back, but it's true. It's and, and life hustle, right? Because it's not just the business, but it's, it's life itself that is being uh, assaulted in many cases. So yes. uh, our half hour is done. Um, okay. Hopefully, uh, next time we'll have Julio because um, I enjoy us having a, a three-way. Um, but um, this was a good one. This was a good conversation. So yeah. we we've got um, we've got a, a better understanding of of what we're talking about when we do when we talk about co-ownership yeah. and um, co-management. It's it's an evolution of what's already happening out there bringing these two things together and seeing yeah. them in, in a new environment. And we also have uh, an understanding of how some of these decisions in this co-owned, co-managed environments are made, that they're made from the standpoint of experimentation, that this yeah. mindset of uh, not letting anyone believe, and for us not to believe ourselves, that we have all the answers because we don't. Nobody has all the answers. And so well, the boss does. Well, traditionally the boss does, but that's what we're trying to, to change here, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the reason that we're having these conversations is because we know that traditionally the fiat lens, I know the answer, I'm the boss. I'm supposed to know the answer. When I was the boss, I knew the answer, not because I knew the answer, but because I was expected to know the answer. So therefore yes. I knew the answer. Yes, you're right. Right? So we need to flip this lens, not simply to see life as it is and, and to actually treat people in a radical way, but to also look at ourselves in the mirror and see that we're not supposed to know shit. We're not yeah. supposed to know everything. We know we don't know everything. You know uh, I want to throw a, a little bit of personal into this. My, it's Laura's birthday today. Okay, Laura, Laura is his wife. So Laura, my wife, and and her mother likes to say whenever she says something um, that she just sort of makes up. She goes, "Oh, you know me. I make shit up," and it's her way of saying. Sometimes I just, you know, stuff comes out of my mouth and I don't know what the hell happened, yeah. which we all do. Yeah. But I love the fact that she says, sometimes I just make shit up. Yeah. That this lens is a lens that recognizes we make shit up, but that's okay. We call it somebody knowing something, somebody having the power to make the decision, somebody, you know, whatever yes. it is. In reality, it's the fiat lens committing to this just because it was uttered by this person it's law it's reality yes. it's real and that person has capital behind of course, it. Uh, of course. It, 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 maybe it's not his capital maybe it's other people's capital but what started the company what created the company was capital and uh and the reality is what makes the company goes is contributions and that was probably the, the biggest lesson I learned from from previous companies, from well, Nearsoft in particular. This was a good one. Um, thank you, Matt. And uh, thank you, Carlos, for the production. And I think we'll close it off here. And next week, uh, next episode of uh, The Pioneers, we will um, cover the next step of this, which is more about the personal side, the meaning, the belonging, and, uh, and discussing what, what we talked about at the beginning, you know, the, look at the person first. So we'll, we'll dig into uh, what, it, what do we mean by meaning and belonging and, and human needs. Right, right, right. Okay. Ciao.